Hello and welcome back to CS 11747 Neural Networks for NLP. This time I'm going to be talking about machine reading with neural networks. So what do I mean by machine reading? In machine reading, essentially what we try to do is read a passage of natural language text and try to answer questions about that passage or otherwise extract useful information from it. This is in contrast to other varieties of question answering, such as knowledge-based question answering, uh, which I'll cover in the next class, in that we need to match uh, the question to an unstructured data source. So to give an example of this, if we have a question, who was the oldest US president to take office? In machine reading, we'd be given a text uh, that says something like, Biden is the oldest elected president, the first from Delaware and the second Catholic, uh, which would help give us a hint that the answer is Joe Biden. And in knowledge-based QA, we might have a structured table that looks a little bit like this, where we have uh, the president's name and age at the start of the presidency. And if we, if we sort by age, then we uh, manage to get the correct answer, the same one. So I'm going to be talking about this machine reading this class. And first, I'd like to go a little bit into machine reading tasks that we might be interested in handling. Um, and specifically, I'll talk about machine reading for question answering, uh, which can include things like multiple choice questions, uh, span selection based questions, or close fill in the blank style questions. And this contrasts with other varieties of machine reading like information extraction, uh, where information extraction essentially what it does is it tries to read a whole bunch of text and extract information in a structured format like the table that I just showed before. So basically, uh, the first three, we are directly provided with a question a priori, and we'd like to try to answer that based on a text that we are given or have to retrieve. So the first variety, multiple choice question tasks, um, there's a bunch of different data sets for this, and I'll try to illustrate uh, each of these types with a specific data set. Um, but for example, there's MC test, uh, which has 500 passages and 2,000 questions about simple stories. So for example, we have a story here about James the turtle who's always getting in trouble. And then we have uh, extra uh, questions over here. And we also have questions like race, uh, uh, data sets like race, which are 28,000 passages of 100,000 questions from English comprehension tests. So uh, notably, particularly in these cases, these are questions that are dif difficult to answer with uh, general background knowledge. So you kind of need the passage to be able to answer them, which is maybe one good uh, desiderata, uh, one of the good desiderata for uh, machine reading tasks. Basically, if you don't do the reading, you don't get the answer right. There's also span selection tasks, and what span selection tasks do essentially is you're given this passage, and for all of the questions, the answer is a sp span in the passage. So if we have what causes precipitation to fall, we'd want to select the span gravity. Um, what is the main form of precipitation besides drizzle, rain, snow, sleet, and hail, um, grapple, and then uh, where do water droplets collide with ice crystals? Uh, it would be within a cloud. Um, so you can see these can also be single word or multi-word spans as well. Um, so squad is a very famous example of this. This is 500 passages and uh, 100,000 questions on Wikipedia text. Um, and then there's lots of other examples like Trivia QA, which is uh, 95k uh, questions and 650k evidence documents. So you can search, uh, there's lots of ones uh, across various domains and with various desiderata. There's also closed questions. Um, so to give an example from the CNN Daily Mail data set, um, these are created from summaries of the articles, of uh, news articles, and you have to guess the entity. So basically you have the original news article and then you have a query like producer X uh, will not press charges against Jeremy Clarkson, his lawyer says. And then you need to fill in the blank X uh, with 
for example, Oisin Taimen, which is entailed by this uh, original passage. The CNN Daily Mail data set, um, in order to prevent kind of background knowledge uh, from slipping in, uh, they basically anonymized all of the entities. So you need to be able to essentially um, get the entity correct, even though you didn't know the actual name. So these are some examples of machine reading tasks. And if we think about what is necessary for machine reading, um, basically, we must take large amounts of information and extract only the salient pairs, uh, parts of it. Um, so we want to pare down the information that we're given in the passage to only the things that are useful to answering. And attention is a good uh, way of doing this, essentially, uh, because attention, you know, it's uh, finding the information that you should be paying most attention to. So a lot of the models are based on attention, self-attention, uh, et cetera. Another thing is that we must perform some sort of reasoning about the information we've extracted. So, you know, we might have individual, um, we might have individual pieces of uh, information that then get combined with other pieces of information in order to make final inferences. And, um, so uh, there's also a lot of focus on multi-step reasoning, for example. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about attention models for machine reading. So um, a basic model is you want to encode the document in the question and generate an answer. Um, so you take the document, you take the question, encode, and uh, extract the answer here. Um, this is a difficult task because encoding whole documents with high accuracy and coverage can be uh, difficult. So um, up until this point, you know, maybe from 2016 to 2019 or so, there was a lot of focus on building models that allowed you to encode these documents effectively to do uh, machine reading and comprehension. So one popular attempt for this is something called bidirectional attention flow, um, where it basically calculates document to context and context to document attention. And um, the way it works is essentially you um, encode the, uh, the context, uh, in other words, the passage that you want to answer, and then you have a query. And um, the query to context and context to query attention are both um, are both performed so you have a uh, essentially calculate a softmax over the uh, over the context words and then you calculate a softmax over the query words and then you add both of these types of context together to a final uh, layer of neural network that extracts things up here so, this was kind of traditionally how uh, we had models that handled the uh, query in context. Um, but in 2019, like to many other parts of NLP, uh, BERT happened uh, to the uh, machine reading comprehension world, and probably particularly for the machine reading comprehension world. So now it's standard to essentially use BERT or other contextualized representations to uh, to do this sort of uh, question and paragraph encoding. So basically all you do is you concatenate all of them into a big uh, into a big sequence uh, separated by a separator token, uh, run them through BERT, and select the start and end span. And of course, you know, it's not just BERT, it's Roberta, it's uh, Excelnet, it's all of the other uh, pre-trained uh, contextualized representations, but essentially uh, it's made my life a lot easier, everybody's life a lot easier, and also this section a lot shorter because uh, now the modeling techniques here uh, tend to be relatively simple. So um, let's say we're talking about span selection QA. Our next um, method 
or our next uh, you know, thing that we need to think about is how do we choose answer spans? And um, the first thing we should do is we should think about word classification versus span classification. So um, if we just wanted to select a single word, what we could do is we could calculate a, uh, a score for each word in the sequence and, um, and predict uh, which word had the highest probability of being the correct for the answer. Um, but here we sometimes need to choose multi-word spans, like within a cloud. And um, uh, this contrasts uh, also with other things like NER. So named entity recognition we've talked about before, it's also a span classification task. But um, in NER, we can have multiple spans. So here we just want the highest scoring span. So the simplest thing that we can possibly do is um, just feed everything through BERT and predict the beginning of the span and the end of the span. And in fact, uh, some models do indeed do this. Um, but the problem is then, you know, we're kind of selecting the end of the span independent of what the beginning of the span is. And as we've talked about in the previous couple uh, classes, you know, some sort of structured prediction can improve accuracy uh, to some extent. So there's also methods that essentially iteratively refine the right and left boundary, left and right boundaries. And the actual mechanism for doing this is not actually so important. Um, but basically, you could feed it through a recurrent neural network that tries to refine the boundaries, or you know, you could. Uh, make the predictions and then feed in the predictions to the, the next uh, predictions and gradually refine until you get the correct answer. Okay, so now we have our basic uh, machine reading comprehension model and um, the combination of, you know, BERT and span prediction works pretty reasonably well uh, BERT or, you know, a, another pre-trained embedding works pretty reasonably well for a lot of tasks. However, uh, for a lot of the more interesting machine reading tasks, uh, they require things like multi-step reasoning, where you actually need to feed in multiple, um, you know, pieces of information and synthesize them into uh, a correct answer. And I think this is where a lot of the interesting work right now is going on in this area. Um, so to give an example, um, uh, it might become clear that more information is necessar necessary post facto. So if we have uh, John went to the hallway and John put down the football, um, if we look at something like this, um, we, uh, a question like where is the football now we need to know a couple things. We need to know where John presently is uh, when he put down the football. And in order to figure out where John presently is, we need to look to the closest, um, or we need to look to the place where he was. Um, so we would need to attend to football, and then we'd need to attend to John, and uh, basically see that John was in the hallway. And this would be made even harder, for example, if we had uh, John went to the hallway, um, George left and went to the bathroom, John put down the football. So then if we just took football and we went to the nearest uh, place, you might say bathroom. Uh, so basically, this is a contrived example, but there's lots and lots of uh, examples of this in actual passages, documents. Um, there's other problems like co-reference and stuff like this that you need to handle. So um, this is actually quite uh, a difficult issue. So there's quite a few um, data sets because it's kind of an interesting problem in, multi um, in uh, machine reading comprehension right now. There's a lot of multi-step data sets. Um, and data sets are they're data sets that are explicitly created to require multiple steps through text, uh, often labeled with supporting facts to demonstrate the, that multiple steps are necessary. Uh, perhaps the most famous example of this is uh, Hot Pot QA, where um, we have questions that were derived from Wikipedia, 
and um, basically they selected two Wikipedia, um, two Wikipedia passages and say, what was the former band of the me member of Mother Love Bone who died just before the release of Apple? And so in order to do this, you need to find uh, that uh, lead singer Andrew Wood died um, and Return to Olympus is the only uh, album uh, by the alternative rock band here. And then you need to figure out that uh, the the Andrew Wood is a member of Mother Love Bone. So then what you do is you um, have Andrew Wood and, um, and Mother Love Bone and other things like this. So if you combine all of this information together, you can finally get um, the answer to this question uh, with confidence. Um, so, Um, there are, uh, one, one thing I, I'm actually going to talk about data set bias a little bit later, but basically, uh, one thing is we should actually be very sure uh, that multi-step reasoning data sets actually do require multi-step reasoning. And this paper by Chen and Durrett is uh, one example of a paper that examines this. But, um, one other thing that you could do is you could do, um, you can see band had broken up, uh, mother love bone, and then just find malfunction uh, up here. And maybe you wouldn't actually need to look at paragraph B at all. So um, uh, there, there are some qualifying uh, things that you should be, uh, should be careful about. But at least in, in theory, many of the things in Hot Pot QA and other data sets do in fact require multi-set reasoning. So um, this is one example of a uh, data set that requires multi-step reasoning or phenomena that require multi-step reasoning. So how do we actually model these? Um, and there's a number of different ways to do so. Um, one way to do so is to feed everything into BERT and just hope it kind of works things out. And BERT, you know, has uh, multiple layers. It has um, six... Uh, or, you know, layer, eight layers, uh, whatever. Um, and you could hope that each of these layers essentially attends to one thing and then attends to another thing and then attends to another thing. And so th at least theoretically, using all of these many layers of multi-hop uh, attention should, uh, of multi-headed attention, should be able to pull in the uh, information that you would like to use. However, there, it's not necessarily the case that this uh, will happen and sometimes more explicit modeling of the kind of reasoning process that the model is going through uh, could give you, a better, uh, give you a better result. So I'm going to go through a couple model architectures that are specifically designed to uh, do so. So memory networks um, are one example of this, and this is a general formulation of models that have access to an external memory through attention, um, and it also describes a specific instantiation for document level QA. Um, so basically the way this works is you do um, QA, uh, you do essentially an argmax over a score, um, over each of the memory items, and you output this memory item. And then after you have output this memory item, you then feed in the memory item and do another uh, level of output. So basically what you're doing is you're doing kind of a recursive process where you have a memory and then you look up things in the memory and then after you've looked up things in the memory, you again uh, try to um, use bo uh, both to get the answer. So um, basically, just to go over this one more time, 
you, uh, you get one output, um, and then you get a second output based on the first output, and then you use both to get the answer. And um, there's actually a kind of nice uh, example of this here, but basically the memory is uh, some external part of the, the model not corresponding to your input, and you can um, do attention over each of the elements in the memory and um, output uh, based on this attention-based uh, sum and use that to then either calculate your answers or calculate attention one more time. So you can think of this iterative process uh, where you gradually step through the memory thinking of, uh, you know, pulling in different pieces of information, synthesizing them, and then referencing other parts of the memory. And this memory could correspond to the input or it could correspond to something entirely different. There are lots of uh, models that also write to memory and read from memory, uh, et cetera. So it kind of functions as an external data store that you can use to do particular uh, operations. So um, these are examples of models that basically have a recursive process where you can uh, continue uh, reasoning, for example, uh, doing attention over your memory, calculating representations, then using those representations to do um, attention over your memory, et cetera, et cetera. So then the question becomes, when do we want to stop doing this? And there's a number of ways to do this. You could do it after a fixed number of operations, um, or you could do it when you uh, attend to a special stop reasoning symbol. Um, so for example, you, you have an extra symbol, so instead of attending to your memory, you attend to the stop reasoning symbol. Um, or you could have an explicit predictor to uh, figure out when you want to stop uh, this kind of multi-hop uh, reasoning. So I think me memory networks are pretty interesting and maybe have been uh, a little bit neglected in uh, recent work on NLP to some extent. So um, I, I think it's worth reading up on these if you find this kind of, uh, you know, idea compelling. So um, another really big uh, development over kind of recent years, basically, uh, has been retrieval-based uh, question answering models. And um, at least in the neural context, uh, the method by Choi et al. in 2017 kind of uh, proposed these, um, where essentially what you do is you first decide which sentences you want to take a look at in the first place. Um, you create a summary of the document, and then you have a downstream neural model that then takes this subset of sentences and, um, and essentially does answer generation. So this is also a variety of multi-hop reasoning in a way because what you're doing is you're essentially um, retrieving some set of information that you think is, is reasonable, that, so there'd be a first hop, and then you're generating the output, which would be a second hop. And you could even think of things where you do retrieval, um, do reasoning, do retrieval again, do reasoning, do retrieval again, do reasoning. So um, uh, that would be another option as well. And uh, there's also methods that do retrieval over very large databases like all of Wikipedia. Uh, and you can see one example in Chen et al. 2017. And uh, these are now becoming very prominent because essentially when you are processing long sequences with BERT or your big neural models, this is extremely computationally expensive. And there's no way you could do that over the entirety of Wikipedia all at once, of course. But uh, at the same time, you know, somewhere in Wikipedia or the entire net, there might be information that you would want to use to solve these, uh, to answer these questions. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, question answering um, works that essentially follow this paradigm recently. Um, one kind of interesting development 
uh, that people have uh, seen recently, and we're going to be talking a little bit more uh, in the next class, is having language models answer, um, answer questions directly themselves. And these retrieval-based models have also been um, applied to this task as well. So in a language model can be used to solve closed style questions. So like, for example, you create uh, Dante was born in a uh, mask where you mask out this, um, this token and essentially it outputs uh, Florence as the answer. Um, and the two paradigms can be combined. So basically what you do is you have the mask at the top of the pyramid um, and then you have a knowledge retriever that basically um, tries to retrieve a document that might be relevant. Uh, you concatenate the two together and then you try to do masked uh, language modeling where you um, uh, predict the correct answer here. And if you have this additional context that you use, um, this allows you to uh, improve the accuracy significantly. Another uh, recently interesting topic is question decomposition for multi-step reasoning. So um, in many multi-hop questions, it's possible to split into multiple questions. So um, this can be done uh, either uh, manually or using some variety of learning. So to, just to give a few examples of this, uh, what color are the majority of the objects? Um, from what yard line did Shane Graham kick two field duels? Um, return the keywords which have been contained by more than 100 ACL papers. And to take the final example uh, over a database, you would find papers, uh, papers that are in ACL, keywords of papers that are in ACL, the number of keywords and papers that are in ACL uh, for each uh, output of uh, three, and um, then the number of keywords uh, where, uh, or the keywords where the number of keywords is more than 100, um, or the number of papers is more than 100. So basically what you do is you can break down um, the question into this incremental process. And this is from a data set called the break data set that kind of uh, defines these operations in a, you know, kind of relatively easy to understand way. Um, you can also kind of less comprehensively do this and just split a more complicated multi-hop question into like two single hop questions that models are more likely to be able to answer. Another interesting development in machine reading comprehension is question answering with context. And I find this very interesting um, because if you think of the various uh, varieties of uh, models, of uh, use cases for machine reading, one of the very prominent varieties is probably being in personal assistance, for example. Uh, I use my own personal assistant uh, to ask it questions, and it does so with uh, varying levels of success, uh, even in uh, even the simpler ones. But anyway, um, so if you're using it in a personal assistant, you can figure that the users will be kind of having a conversation with the uh, personal assistant. So all of the questions they ask will be based on the previous context they've seen. So if we have, uh, what is the origin of Daffy Duck? Um, the response is, he first appeared in Porky's Duck Hunt. Um, what was he like in that episode? Assertive, unrestrained, and combative. So basically, um, in that episode, refers back to that episode. Was he the star? No, uh, barely more than an unnamed bit player. So it's, was he, Daffy Duck, the star of uh, that episode? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, um, you know, this is interesting because you need to manage context and reference and other things like this. So um, I, I think it's an interesting topic. 
So one caveat, um, and this is a caveat in all of NLP, but maybe particularly in machine reading due to the way that data sets tend to be created, is about data sets. And um, all data sets have their biases. So uh, no matter what the task is, data bias matters. Um, and for example, uh, these can include things like domain bias, so only being included in one domain. Um, simplifications to the problem setting to make it tractable to create data. Um, and uh, also another thing, important thing that I didn't mention here is bias of, you know, who the people are who created the data. Uh, maybe they are not representative of your underlying user population or, you know, the underlying pop population of the people uh, uh, in the world, for example. Um, but in particular for uh, reading comprehension, real large scale copyright free data sets are pretty hard to come by. And um, often data sets created from weak supervision have not been uh, vetted. So to give an example of what I mean here, um, there's the baby data set that was used uh, for a while in reading comprehension. And this was created by automatically generating synthetic tests aimed at evaluating whether a model can learn certain characteristics of language. Um, such as the single supporting fact questions, two supporting fact questions, three supporting fact questions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that these are very simple uh, formulaic uh, language. And um, this happens to greater extents or lesser extents in other situations as well. Um, and the issue here is, um, you know, this is far more simplistic than any question you're going to encounter in the world. So uh, because of this, uh, the ability to answer these formulaic questions doesn't necessarily scale to, uh, you know, anything that we uh, care about um, and the claims uh, made about ability to learn language are, are not necessarily going to be uh, true here. That being said, you know, these might be interesting um, as controlled environments, but uh, take it with a grain of salt, whether these will actually be able to be used in real cases. Another examination example is uh, the popular CNN Daily Mail data set. And I really like this paper and recommend you read it if you uh, are interested in knowing a bit more about, uh, you know, how data sets are created or uh, the problems that you might have with them. Uh, but basically, it revealed um, very few sentences requiring complex reasoning, and uh, many were too difficult due to anonymization or wrong preprocessing. So, for example, uh, many of the answers could be done only by exact match or paraphrasing, um, and uh, only a few actually required reasoning over multiple sentences. And another uh, interesting example is, that demonstrates how brittle uh, machine reading models can be are um, basically this uh, paper on adversarial examples in machine reading. And what they demonstrate is that if you add a sentence or word string specifically designed to distract the model, um, this could drop the accuracy of state-of-the-art models from 81 to 46. So basically, um, they took the question they synthesized a statement and uh, added kind of distractor entities and concatenated this to the end of the uh, passage. And if they did this, then they basically uh, were able to trick models uh, like a fairly large portion of the time. And what this demonstrates basically is that the model is not latching, uh, learning, you know, true reasoning ability because no, no or very few humans would be tricked by this kind of uh, distractor sentence, but rather the model is latching on to some uh, patterns in the data, such as the fact that things near the end of the passage tend to be more salient, um, or things with high word overlap uh, with the question tend to be more salient. And, um, so we should take this with a grain of salt when we deploy the system about whether it would actually be able to uh, do a good job. So there's also um, a development uh, of adversarial creation of new data sets. Um, so the idea being that we'd like to create data sets where current models do poorly, but human models do well. 
uh, but humans do well. So the process is, um, you know, from a reading comprehension data set, we generate potential answers uh, from a language model. Um, find ones where a question answering model does poorly on um, and have humans filter them for naturalness. And so just to give an example, um, we, uh, we might take a passage and uh, feed it into a question generation model um, and then have humans uh, filter them, uh, filter out the, the plausible questions. Um, one issue with this is that adversarial examples, because we're sampling them from kind of biased distribution of finding uh, questions where QA models do poorly on, um, adversarial examples can be artificially hard or noisy or not representative of the, the actual ones. So um, that's another thing to take with a grain of salt anytime you've, uh, you see an adversarially created data set. Um, it may just be finding questions that are kind of contrived or um, uh, like basically not the, the types of questions we actually want to answer. So it's an interesting idea, but um, worth uh, scrutiny as well. So given this, um, I think it's worth thinking about what the real uh, gold standard uh, for machine reading data sets is. And I think it, this natural questions data set really follows this gold standard. So basically, they get questions naturally from search logs. Um, and this is a paper by, by Google, so they have the search availability of the search logs already. And then they use crowd workers to find corresponding evidence. And then you get things like what color was John Wilkes Booth's hair um, with a Wikipedia page and, um, and the kind of corresponding context. Um, can you make and receive calls in airplane mode um, with a Boolean answer of no? And um, also some, some ones where basically the, uh, the, where no context was available. And so this, I, I think this is really the gold standard because essentially we're, we have questions that were generated according to the exact same way that the users of the system would actually be generating questions, which is spontaneously. Um, and so if you're thinking of creating a, a data set um, or thinking of using a data set and want to choose between the ones you use, I think this is definitely the most realistic way of doing so. That being said, um, there are lots of cases where you won't be able to get easily get access to natural looking questions. Um, and you know, for particular types of reasoning, they, uh, it might be even harder. So there are particular things that you want to test, it might be even harder. So creating synthetic data sets uh, where you have uh, crowd workers design questions, for example, is still uh, certainly an option. Okay, so the last thing that I want to talk about is symbolic reasoning plus neural networks. And I think this is an interesting topic. Um, as, and as an aside, um, it, it's definitely worth mentioning that neural networks were not the advent of uh, you know, reasoning about natural language. Um, it, of, of course, you know, there, there was lots of work on computer science uh, and natural language processing research before the neural network boom started in the uh, 2010s. And um, one of the big tools that people used uh, previously was kind of semantic, um, turning things into a semantic representation and doing reason reasoning over those semantic representations. And this is an example of this, uh, where you're doing reasoning over clauses. Um, and there's a really nice book, Representation and Inference for Natural Language, uh, that uh, lays out exactly how you can do this um, well. And most neural network models are just a very rough approximation of this. They might be able to do this to some extent, but they're certainly not very good at it. 
um, and not very precise and don't extrapolate to new examples, for example. And to just give an example of this, um, this figure is from a, uh, a paper examining whether uh, word embeddings have essentially ideas of uh, numeracy of numbers. And you can see that uh, from a particular, uh, within a particular range, um, the word embeddings are relatively good at doing this. Um, but outside of that particular range, uh, they're not able to extrapolate at all. And the blue, the blue dots here are examples that the model was essentially trained on. And the red dots are models, uh, examples that the model was not trained on. And you can see that the moment things are not included in the training data, it's just not very easy to extrapolate at all. Um, so there's uh, been some work on machine reading with symbolic representations in neural networks that I think is pretty interesting. And um, there's a, an example of this is the drop data set, which basically contains um, a bunch of questions that would require this numerical reasoning in order to answer correctly, um, including things like uh, subtraction or comparison or uh, other things like this. And um, there's a number of ways you could solve these problems. Um, a lot of uh, the methods that attempt to solve these problems uh, essentially combine something like semantic parsing uh, which, if you'll remember, I mentioned before, is uh, the generation of underlying semantic representations like programs um, that have explicit functions together with machine reading. So basically, uh, the way this works is you have like find, and then you have filter, find, max, um, relocate. And this is kind of um, a whole bunch of uh, explicit functions. And then these explicit functions that you call um, can be realized, for example, as neural components or, or something else. So um, I think this is a really interesting uh, topic here, especially if you like, you know, model uh, model building. Um, in that this is a problem that even our most powerful old neural models certainly haven't solved yet, and there's still a lot of room for improvement. So that is all I have for today. Um, for our discussion, I'm going to suggest several papers that I mentioned um, uh, during the talk today and suggest that you might try to read one that sounds uh, particularly interesting to you. And uh, we can have more discussion of uh, kind of what you found interesting there and the uh, possible improvements to those models uh, in the class. So thank you very much.